the arid Nevada desert springs a glittering spectacle. It's medieval England. It's Caesar's Rome. It's ancient Egypt. It's New York City. It's 11 of the world's 12 largest hotels, gateways to the biggest playground in the world. Now, enter the fantasy in the desert. Las Vegas hotels are modern marvels. Las Vegas form follows fantasy and in all of these fantasy environments you find ideas emotions that tap into some very deep feelings of the mass market there's a desire for a sense of meaning of narrative being able to put yourself into these different stories whether it's pirates or ancient Egypt or South Sea Island or, or the Old West the storytellers behind Las Vegas hotels have proved the truth of build it and they will come. Between 1990 and 1996, the city added 33,000 new hotel rooms and an equal number of new visitors flocked to occupy them. What other city in the world, from the moment you arrive, do you become part of a fantasy? We're the world's largest adult theme park where you recognize you're gonna come and for three to five days you can be anywhere you want to be and anyone you choose to be. Pirates are loving contraband on the dock! The scurvy cutthroats have the cheek to fly the Jolly Roger! These buildings are not monuments. They sometimes are getting perceived as monuments, but they're not. We're going to change them. We are going to change these buildings. I mean, I have been doing this for 20 years, and even I have torn down things that I have built in, in that short of a career. stops began life as a way station in the timeless Nevada desert. Located on the rail line between Los Angeles and Salt Lake City, Las Vegas was established in 1903 as a sober working class community to support the railroad. The tiny hamlet went about its quiet ways until government actions transformed the area. In 1931, gambling was legalized. The same year, construction began on the Boulder Dam, just 30 miles from the city limits. The dam, later renamed for Herbert Hoover, flooded the area with thousands of workers, eager for a place to spend their paychecks on Saturday nights. The population expanded because of so many thousands of workers working on the dam, but also Las Vegas had never seen itself as a resort community as so many hundreds of thousands of people came to see this huge magnificent project going up this was the time when Las Vegas first began to see itself as possibly a resort destination so the dam played a very crucial role in that in the early years what Las Vegas thought it had to sell was the Old West the mythical American West featured saloons and gambling halls and in Vegas, one could find something close to the real thing. You could drink and carouse like an old-time cowboy, enjoying authentic liquor and a campy, tongue-in-cheek atmosphere. The big breakthrough came in 1941 with the opening of the El Rancho Hotel, a rambling ranch house. It transplanted the imagined splendor of the Old West to casinos, and brought lavish decor and thematic architecture to the Strip. A year later, the last frontier developed a couple of miles further out the Strip. Old-timers at the time were shaking their heads and saying Las Vegas is simply not large enough to accommodate two resort hotels. But Vegas and its western theme flourished. 
Over the next decade, gambling houses with evocative names like Hotel Apache and the Golden Nugget sprang up across the desert landscape. In 1951, the casino Pioneer Club introduced a neon icon named Vegas Vic. His arm was animated and he had a, uh, a cigarette in his mouth that kept flickering and originally as well his voice said howdy partner to a friendly lanky cowboy type which became from the early 1950s on real logo of las vegas while the western theme sold well california investor billy wilkerson dreamed of attracting a more sophisticated clientele to the desert in 1945, he began construction on the Flamingo Hotel, only to run out of money before completing it. Mobster Bugsy Siegel stepped into the breach, buying the Flamingo and sparing no expense in making it the most modern, most luxurious destination in Vegas history. Here was a swank Hollywood nightclub transported to the Nevada desert. The Flamingo had a special attraction. The Flamingo had a showroom, and it brought some serious name entertainment to Las Vegas. They became an attraction unto themselves. People came for the entertainment. I remember my first show that I ever saw in a nightclub was at the Flamingo, and I saw Lena Horne. And I was absolutely astounded. Despite its star power, the Flamingo at first floundered under its then unheard of six million dollar construction costs. His mob patrons blamed Bugsy for the slow return on their investment. Just seven months after his hotel opened, he was gunned down in his Hollywood home. Bugsy was singularly unsuccessful until he died. And I think people came to Las Vegas to see what this guy had created, what had gotten him in so much trouble that his uh, business associates had eliminated him. The Flamingo's first owner had gone bust. Its second had spent other people's money with abandon and paid the price. Yet in time, their joint vision was vindicated as the Flamingo became a moneymaker and established a whole new style for Las Vegas. Attracted by plush surroundings and top entertainment, men in tuxedos and women in evening gowns came to gamble away their riches. The sophistication of the Flamingo just broke open the market for Las Vegas. It was no longer just this western dude ranch, easygoing sort of place. It upped the ante. It was a much more glamorous and sophisticated place. Bold entrepreneurs and timely government projects had transformed the desert into an oasis. The glitter of ancient Rome would soon invite the wonderland to new heights of hedonism. The gambling and tourism industry in Las Vegas generates more revenue annually than any other. Only the U.S. Mint generates money faster. Modern Marvels will continue in a moment. We now return to Las Vegas Hotels on Modern Marvels. With the success of the Flamingo Hotel, Las Vegas entered a golden age of expansion. Self-contained casino resorts sprang up as fast as they could be built. By the mid-1950s, Highway 91 in the middle of Nevada had become a glittering three-mile tribute to hedonism. What followed the Flamingo, one after another, were bigger and more hotels, more of everything. And they were all little mini oases. Each new pleasure palace was determined to top the rest. 
In 1953, the Flamingo was forced to remodel to compete with the ultra-modern Sands Hotel. The casinos vied to attract top entertainers, and gambling revenue allowed them to lure talent like Frank Sinatra, with paychecks of $50,000 a week. One of the biggest draws was a series of atomic bomb tests conducted over the Las Vegas Proving Grounds. Las Vegas learned how to use the nuclear bomb for publicity. They would have things like uh, Miss Atomic Bomb contests. They would have mushroom hairdos. There was a contest for atomic cocktails. And even the hotels on the then emerging Las Vegas Strip would publish schedules of nuclear tests, would invite their guests to take box lunches up to the mountains, and in the pre-dawn hours they would be able to see the sky light up and those pretty mushroom clouds float away. The entertainers, the atomic picnics, the resort amenities, all were merely devices to draw customers into casinos. Inside, then as now, there were no clocks, windows, or easily found exits. Creating an air of unreality that treated gamblers like bouncing pinballs. There tended to not be straight axes through casinos. You kind of had to wind your way through. You didn't know what was left, right. You barely knew what was up and down, because you could use mirrors every place to confuse you with that one. And you certainly didn't know whether it was night or day. In the 1950s and 60s, Las Vegas was a completely car-oriented environment. One could drive the entire strip without spotting a pedestrian. And with nary a sidewalk, cars were used even to travel to a neighboring building. Hotel architecture adjusted to accommodate the car, providing ever flashier signs designed to be read from the highway. In Las Vegas, they took the neon sign and they made it something completely unique, completely new. It was this image of the neon sign which told you everything you needed to know about the building and why you should be there. It drew people in. Built in 1958, the Stardust sign was three stories high with lights bursting into a cosmic explosion that progressed through a 20-minute animation sequence. A purely decorative piece of architecture, totally made out of light. The whole building created the illusion that it was just one big light show. It was like the modern kind of computerized extravaganzas and LED signs we see today at places like Times Square, way before its time. Las Vegas of the 1960s, builder Jay Sarno stood out as a showman and a visionary. He took the notion of thematic architecture and raised it to a new level with Caesar's Palace. In 1966, when Caesar's Palace opened, they brought a special kind of magic. Caesar's had a very, very special quality to it. It had a theme, a real honest-to-God theme. Caesars was actually a hodgepodge of Roman, Greek, Baroque, and even modern architecture. The building presented no particular period in time. It represented a mystique of casual elegance. From the swimming pool shaped like a Roman bath, to the heroic statues strewn about the casino, this was the most completely themed casino Las Vegas had ever seen. Good design, good architecture, whatever it might be, is consistent. The more consistent it is, the, the 
the easier it is to understand. You don't want the experience to be a cerebral experience. You want it just to happen. You don't want anybody to think about it. You want them just to enjoy it. From the moment they walked in the door, guests at Caesars enjoyed the feeling of being special. And they happily paid a premium for the experience. Caesars Palace, there's no apostrophe in there. It's plural, Caesars. And Sarno explained this as everyone who comes there is a Caesar. He wasn't talking about any one Caesar who had this palace. Any visitor, any gambler who came to Caesars Palace was a Caesar. This was theme architecture. It was creating an entire environment which would transport people to another time, another place. While Sarno was busy constructing Caesars, another maverick came to town. Billionaire Howard Hughes had a mission to rid Las Vegas of its shady underworld aura. From 1965 to 1970, he lived in the penthouse floor of the Desert Inn, going so far as to buy the hotel when they threatened to evict their eccentric tenant. Without ever emerging from his room, Hughes bought a series of casinos and threw his support behind the Corporate Gaming Act of 1969. Prior to 1969, all owners of a hotel had to be licensed, and that would have been impossible with a broadly held company. After 1969, of course, corporations like Holiday Inn, MGM, Bally's, and so forth could provide enormous sums of money for the future development of Las Vegas. Fueled by deep corporate pockets, Vegas turned to mega hotels, huge structures with thousands of rooms. These hotels were among the largest in the world. Their use as casinos only added to the difficulty of designing them. They're buildings that operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That brings a whole nother uh, multitude of problems that need to be dealt with in a facility that that never sleeps it never closes down unique design problems for the 21st century caesar's impresario jay sarno had shown the limitless potential of hotel theming howard hughes had cleared the way for corporate america to invade the world of gambling Backed by imagination and money, Vegas hotels were poised to reach for the sky. The 120-foot high sign in front of Circus Circus featuring Lucky the Clown was built in 1968 for a cost of $1 million. The hotel itself cost just $15 million. Modern Marvels will continue in a moment. We now return to Las Vegas Hotels on Modern Marvels. Howard Hughes left Las Vegas for good in 1970, leaving behind a legacy of corporate money. In his wake, international hotel chains moved in, erecting larger versions of their typical buildings. It changed the atmosphere of Las Vegas. You didn't have these individual crazy entrepreneurs with a vision who were able to force through something like Caesar's Palace, who were able to force through by their own will something like the Flamingo Hotel. High rises began dominating the strip, dwarfing and replacing the great neon signs that had defined Las Vegas. A single hotel casino might service 3,000 guests along with nearly as many support staff demanding a vast infrastructure. You have to take into consideration the fact that there has to be a, a huge amount of redundancy. So you never rely on one water source. You never rely on one power source. Things that are at the heart, the energy that the building requires for its physical demands are engineered in a completely different way because of this factor of never closing the building down. I mean, that is the mortal sin, never to close the building. 
Las Vegas' new corporate masters soon realized that size meant little without a storyline behind it. The way to a customer's heart and his wallet was to create the best costume party around and ask him to join the fun. What we do in Las Vegas is that we put you on stage. We invite you to come on to our stage. What we'd like to inject into the whole thing is romance. The way romance makes us feel, we never get tired of. So if we can incorporate romance into something, then I will have you back and back many, many times and enjoying yourself and feeling wonderful about yourself. For the last 20 years, Las Vegas architects have faced a daunting challenge to make their hotels bigger than the rest, to imbue them with a consistent and involving theme, and to build them fast. With so much money at stake and constant pressure to relieve a fickle public of their hard-earned dollars, these steel giants leap skyward with astonishing speed. If we were to wait until we actually had the end product designed, these buildings would be taking four and five years to build instead of two and three years to build. So what we've had to do is we've had to go after a more universal structure. By universal structures, I mean spaces that have far less columns in them, buildings that have much higher ceilings in them, which give designers much more flexibility as to how they're going to arrange the non-structural or non-bearing walls inside the movie set. I mean, that's what these are. These are not historical buildings. People will not be coming here 2,000 years from now and looking at these buildings. This is one large movie set that continually evolves and continually changes. Suddenly, in 1978, Las Vegas faced its worst nightmare when Atlantic City, New Jersey legalized gambling. In the years since, gambling has spread to scores of reservations, riverboats, and localities. Contrary to original fears, the competition has actually benefited Las Vegas. As it has grown over the years, Las Vegas has become the place to come. It's the mecca for gamblers. There are so many other things going on around the country, but basically all that does is whet the appetites for people to come to the mecca. The original MGM Grand, opened in 1972, was both quasi-film set and brassy evocation of 1920s movie palaces. Presenting grandeur with a popular flair, it offered children the magic of movies and adults the nostalgia of a bygone era. Anticipating huge crowds, the MGM architects turned a dilemma into an opportunity designing a massive porte cochere, an outdoor awning capable of covering scores of limousines. At once decorative and functional, the porte cochere created the grand entrance, an elegant ceremony presided over by costume doormen. This started a trend. You'll see in a succession of hotels after that, each porte cochere got larger, more glamorous, more glitzy throughout the 1970s. In 1980, tragedy struck when a deadly fire swept through the MGM Grand, killing 84 people. During the blaze, some gamblers on hot streaks refused to leave the football field-sized casino and were finally herded out just minutes before advancing flames consumed its 1,000 slot machines. Today, high-tech monitoring systems make Las Vegas safety procedures among the most stringent in the world. And there is much to monitor. A lone mega-hotel consumes 15 million gallons of water and 7 million kilowatts of electricity each month, enough to service over 3,000 homes. 
Technology helps also to safeguard the profit margin as eye in the sky cameras capture the play at gaming tables. Pictures of every table are flashed to a giant control center where they're examined 24 hours a day. Anyone on a hot streak gets a closer look and has his photo preserved for future reference. With an even greater concentration of huge hotels, Las Vegas has gradually become an urban environment. In the town where car was king, people now walk between competing attractions. The hotels have literally put their front doors right out on the edge of their property with some kind of big moving sidewalk like uh, into the Mirage or into uh, Caesar's Palace that scoops you up right at the very edge of the sidewalk and whisks you into the casino. The funny thing about that is, of course, that those moving sidewalks only work one direction. It isn't like in an airport where you can take a moving sideway going both directions. In Vegas, you can only go in. You're on your own getting out. Whether on foot or in a car, visitors to the Strip frequently find themselves trapped with mobs of fellow fun seekers. Personally, I think gridlock is good. I think gridlock is part of the reason people come to Las Vegas. They love to be with other people. This is Times Square almost every night of the year. Like Times Square, in recent years, Las Vegas hotels have decided to clean up their act. Beginning with Circus Circus in 1975, they have actively pursued the family market. Gone are most of the semi-nude dancing girls. In are the arcades and the animal acts. In the grand tradition of Las Vegas entrepreneurs, the transition from adult fantasy land to family resort was spearheaded by one man. Steve Wynn had a vision that Las Vegas could be something more than just casinos with hotel rooms. He showed the industry that they had only just begun to grow. He was the catalyst that began the building boom where every casino had a new and bigger and better idea on how to entertain our tourist population. When the MGM Grand opened in 1993, it took 39 armored cars two nights to move the $3.5 million in quarters necessary to run the casino. Modern marvels will continue in a moment. We now return to Las Vegas Hotels on Modern Marvels. In 1977, Vegas pioneer Steve Wynn bought the old Golden Nugget Casino. He promptly added his first hotel wing, threw in a dash of salesmanship, and revived it as a money-making operation. Quiet beginning to what became a very loud empire. Steve Wynn is probably the most demanding client I've ever had. He's also the best client I ever had. He's willing to put some money up and he supports everyone on the design team and he's pushing all the time and always always looking for a better way to create the mirage hotel in the late 1980s win raised a then unheard of 700 million dollars he was building the most costly hotel in las vegas history and gambling on selling a new concept with the opening of the Mirage, Las Vegas took an entirely different direction, where it wasn't just about gambling, it was about each hotel being an attraction in and of itself. 
Gwyn envisioned the Mirage as a South Seas paradise, an irresistible tropical playground sprung from the Nevada desert. With the Mirage, Gwyn promised a complete environmental experience to dwarf even Caesar's palace. Rather than simply a pleasant backdrop to gaming, this thematic design was its own form of entertainment. Wynn boldly presented his new kind of casino by building the first major street-side attraction in town, a 40-foot erupting volcano. The volcano at the Mirage was a, a challenge that Steve Wynn put on the table, and that was to say that not even Walt Disney has attempted a volcano yet. Uh, and that was our mandate. He wanted to see a volcano that, in fact, everyone would believe it was a real volcano. This volcano had to erupt safely and spectacularly every hour, regulating the amount of natural gas and triggering it with an electronic ignition made the explosion controllable. Attention to detail included scenting the blast with a pina colada aroma that was both pleasant and suggestive of the South Seas. What was hard was lighting it. That's what was hard. Because you have the light, number one, from the explosion, but in between the explosions, the lighting effect on the tumbling water and on the stonework, that was by far the, the most challenging thing. For much of the Mirage decor, Wynn and his design team went with the theory that God is the best architect. Bring in real tropical landscaping, Believing also that nature can always be improved upon, they lit the trees with artificial yet romantic glow. When you see these beautiful, growing, living things lit so sexy, so subtle, so wonderful, that's when the imagination begins to happen, and that's when architecture is at its highest point. For the Mirage high-rise, one of nature's most precision elements would be used to create a glittering facade. Each of its 3,000 rooms look out through glass containing 24 karat gold. Real gold glass doesn't turn green when the blue sky is reflected off of it. The gold glass is made from copper when the sun or the sky is reflected off of it look green. We didn't want the building to be green. We want it to be called. In 1993, Wynn unveiled a larger-than-life version of every boy's fantasy. Treasure Island Hotel and Casino. Here, the sidewalk attraction was Buccaneer Bay, a Disney-esque pirate village that the pirates of old would have built if they could have afforded it. Every 90 minutes, each night, a full-scale theatrical presentation plays out in the bay. Audiences find themselves right in the thick of the action as pirates battle a British frigate. Steve Wynn was busy transforming Las Vegas into his version of Disneyland. Others began to realize a hidden secret behind the Magic Kingdom. If you really look at Disneyland, Disneyland is a shopping center. People plan vacations around going to a shopping center. Meaning that if you really take a second look at Disneyland, it is full of retail and it is full of food and beverage. Eager to match Disneyland's success, Las Vegas hotels have vastly expanded their shopping facilities. The forum shops at Caesars Palace lead the new trend, offering an array of upscale shops tied together by the setting, a mock Roman street. The lighting speeds through a 24-hour cycle every three hours, subtly heightening the excitement. Freely mixing ancient tales and modern technology, the Euro Mall features a statue of Bacchus that leaps to life in full animatronic splendor. 
And in this symporium, lack of tradition is a virtue. Gambling for dad, shopping for mom, dolphins for the kids. By the 1990s, Las Vegas had nearly perfected the family resort. In 1993, Steve Wynn tore down the dunes to make way for his newest hotel. The pirate ship at Treasure Island fired a simulated cannonball across town to the dunes. Where the famed sign and hotel were timed to implode with the cannon blast. It was a unique show and a spectacular symbol of out with the old, in with the new. Wynn's innovations have opened the floodgates to bold new ideas and the next generation of hotels would meld form and fantasy as never before. The Caesar shopping complex cost over 100 million dollars to build. It draws about 30,000 visitors a day. Modern marvels will continue in a moment. We now return to Las Vegas Hotels on Modern Marvels. Modern Las Vegas is the number one resort destination in the country and the mecca for serious gamblers. Casinos still vie for the business of high rollers, the super rich who think nothing of losing a million dollars in a weekend. The ornate Pompeii Suite at Caesars Palace lists at $7,500 a night, but invariably is given gratis to high rollers. They lounge about the four-bedroom duplex amid Baroque columns, gilded tapestries, and Italian frescoes. Everything that we design, we put a storyline to it. Whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a shopping center, whether it's a casino, we create a storyline. So we have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Each storyline is complemented by the latest technology. Racing to provide customers with the hottest new thrills, hotels are constantly upgrading their attractions to boost sensory stimulation. sound systems that are in the casinos and in the restaurants are extremely complex. They're as complex as what you might find in any good movie studio. And we actually have departments and divisions of people who look at sound for these different environments on a continual basis. In recent years, the best show in town has become the buildings themselves. 1990 brought the 4,000 room Excalibur an Arthurian extravaganza complete with moat, drawbridge, and fire-breathing dragon. In 1993, the new MGM Grand opened its doors, immediately becoming the largest hotel on Earth. Perhaps the most distinctive building in town is the Luxor Hotel, an ultra-modern take on ancient Egypt. It's 30 stories and 26,783 glass plates shimmer in the desert sun. Standing guard in front is a new kind of sign, a giant sphinx scaled 50% larger than the original. Inside, its atrium takes up 29 million cubic feet making it the largest in the world. Even going to one's room is an adventure, with elevators that rise at an angle of 39 degrees to match proportions devised long ago by Egyptian architects. At night, the pyramid performs a vanishing act. It's like a black hole in the middle of the strip. Everything else is lights and waving all these megawatts at you to get your attention. And suddenly there's this neg totally negative thing, this big black uh, object. It's almost invisible at night. The Luxor is topped by the brightest beacon in the world, 
40 billion candle power of light shooting into the night sky. Ironically, since light is only visible when it hits something, and the desert air is especially clean, this super searchlight does little but cause havoc for pilots flying overhead. The latest leap in Las Vegas architecture is recreating actual modern cities. The Hotel Casino New York, New York takes a place well known to millions, transporting its physical presence and bustling atmosphere in startling detail. The difficulty in creating this project overall was the fact that you didn't want it to come off in a cartoonish fashion. You wanted the details to be so substantial and so real that people could identify with the project and in New York City, inside and outside. The giant facade collected a dozen of the Big Apple's most famed towers, recreating them at one-third scale. The Las Vegas version of the Empire State Building stretches 47 stories high, enough to make it the tallest structure in the city. The idea that it was a very large project didn't really hit us until we found out that between this project and the one next door, we had consumed all of the number 11 reinforcing bars and 14 reinforcing bars in the country. Now that's a lot of steel, considering that this is, these are largely concrete projects. New York, New York is monumental architecture and perhaps the biggest piece of pop art in the world. It draws people into a unique environment, surrounding them with Art Deco details of New York in the 1920s. People from New York really like it, which is so wonderful. And to have those people come here and be happy with it and enjoy it. Uh, we've created everything except the smells and the muggings and all the, all the litter around. We've tried to eliminate as much of that as possible. In some ways, this fantasy New York has surpassed the original. Each year, three million people cross the 300-foot Brooklyn Bridge that leads to its entrance. Approximately 20 times the number that walk the span between Brooklyn and Manhattan. In New York, citizens avoid Central Park at night for fear of robbery. In the Central Park that overgrows the casino, patrons eagerly line up for the chance to be relieved of their money. New York, New York is the largest expression of the world's greatest theme park. A city with the dollars, the imagination, and the whimsy to try anything. Las Vegas is a city built by people who dream big dreams. Entrepreneurs who aren't afraid to take a risk. I even look back when they first built the Mirage and those of us in the business community were all saying, oh, how are you ever gonna meet the debt on a $700 million property? Today they're building billion plus. They're building suites that in and of themselves are $17 million to build. It's a city that every idea becomes a stepping stone to a grander idea. It's a city where entrepreneurs are not afraid to gamble on building a bigger, brighter future. Oh, fire in the sky, the end is nigh. Get your marshmallows on your sticks, kiddies. It